Can everyone hear? Um, this is a story that begins really in 2008 um, when I received an email from Mark Strachan um, in the North Ayrshire Museum Service. Um, he is responsible for the Ardrossan sarcophagus um, and lid. Oops. There it is. Um, and he'd come across a quote uh, from the 1911 edition of the Ardrossan and Salt Quotes Herald um, from a Dr. Ross of the Royal Commission who'd come out to look um, at the address in sarcophagus when it had first been discovered. And he said, the carved lid, so far as I know, is one of the finest of its kind in Scotland, and is a specimen of medieval art at its purest, and the only one in Scotland, so far as I can remember, that approaches it in beauty of design and execution is now in Duddock Castle Museum in Dundee. So um, at that point, I didn't I'd like to say I was new in the job, but I've been there for four years. Um, but I wasn't quite aware of the existence of these, and I said, at least, I'm sure if we had something of that importance, I would know all about it. Um, but finally, I came across some records of an, in an out store um, that really just said, carved stone. Um, and when we went to go look at them, we did find these shelves and shelves of carved stones. And you can see how tightly packed they are. You couldn't even take photographs of them. Um, the only record of them really is what were some drawings from the 19th century that the Society of Antiquaries um, had. And there was one, one of the stories had been recorded by the Royal Commission and that was it. Um, so originally the project was just going to consist of just, just trying to get them off these shelves and, and photographed. Um, even that would require specialist moving equipment. Um, but then after I had a conversation with um, Graham Cavers of AOC Archaeology, we kind of thought that we could do a bit more than just photographing them, and that's how the idea of scanning them um, came into um, play. Um, so that's how it became a larger project, um, which we received heritage lottery funding for. And originally, we were just going to take them off the shelves, scan them, um, and put them back into storage. But um, it kind of coincided with, with renewed interest in the steeple church. The, the, the steeple as a building, um, and as we, as we told you earlier, the, the steeple is actually four different churches, but the actual tower, the steeple, belongs to um, Dundee City Council, and, and that's, that's probably the only surviving medieval section um, of the building. So it became a project to get the stones out of storage, to display them in the steeple, and to make a much more community um, project out of it. So there's also, um, we started up a website, and then the scans could go on the website, be rotatable, um, and people could get a closer look at the stones. Um, well, so, well, here they are getting moved back in. So this is what I need about specialist equipment. Um, we had to get a flat bed and a crane um, to basically sort of um, sling them into the doors of the depot um, and roll them inside um, because they're so large and heavy. Um, the steeple itself has gone through quite a bit of, of, of ups and downs. I'll just give you a short biography of it. Um, it was traditionally founded in 1190 by um, David Earl of Huntingdon. Supposedly, in giving thanks um, after he'd been rescued from a storm at sea and coming back from the Crusades. Um, there are a few problems with this story, like one of them being that he was probably never in the Crusades. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, um, <laughs> but it was at the time, Dundee had two patron saints. It was St. Clements was an earlier patron saint of Dundee. Um, but at the time, this people was founded and dedicated to St. Mary. There's a Marian cult going through Europe. Um, and it was pro probably um, a more of a political move, but it, it's a nice story to say um, that he was coming back from the Crusades. Um, so the church that was founded in 1190, whatever it was, was torched in 1303 by Edward I. And then in the early 15th century, um, they began to rebuild the, this people, which they finished in 1480. Um, and that square tower, what's known as the Old Steeple, um, is all that's left today. 
In 1547, Dundee was captured by the English again, and the church burned down again, um, and only the tower and the choir were remaining. So it had various other disasters um, and rebuilds in the 16th to 18th century, and became those four churches um, and buildings in the precinct. In 1841, it had another fire. Um, this time it was a heating system, so you can't blame um, the English. And only the tower and the nave um, survived that particular disaster. So it was during this time, during the series of rebuilding, um, that these stones came to light. In 1838, during the construction of a drain in the old East Church, one of the first stones was found. And we don't know what the original footprint um, of the church was like. Ian, the story of Ian McCroft thinks it was probably pretty similar to what, how it is today, um, the shape of it anyway, and the, and the size of it. We don't know, we'll never be able to prove it. But these stones were found at the eastern end, um, which is where Primark is today, um, which is probably where the high altar was, so um, it makes sense. And according to a contemporary report, when these stones were found, um, there were also found silver pennies, a coffin breastplate, a short sword, and various other arms and armor, including a two-handed sword. All these relics were picked up and carried away by parties who attended the operation of making the drain. So, people <laughs> watching the drain got to walk off with antiquities. Um, in 1842, while they're excavating the foundation of the new East Church after that fire, um, the, the stone with the ship on it was found. And the other stones seem to be discovered about this time, and there are eight stones altogether. There are also descriptions of stones with hunting horns, compasses, and squares, but the whereabouts of these stones is unknown. What do we know about these stones? We know that they covered elite burials within the church, and they're probably a very small survivor of the number that would have been in there. Um, the most important would, of course, have been the closest to the high altar. But we know in the 15th century there are more than 40 altars in the church. Um, many have been associated with medieval guilds, which would later become the trades in Dundee. And we know that they met um, at the various altars before the Reformation. And after this, after the Reformation, this would transfer to the, the city graveyard, the Hauf, where they met at the graves of their members. Um, we know there were burials beneath the floor in the church. As in 2011, um, when they put in a new floor, they did come across burials. And they were quite neatly laid out, so there, there must have been some markers. Um, the wealthy would have paid for layers, and they would have paid for masses to be said. Um, we also know that, that there's some certain real estate the archives have come across in the town that there's a St. Margaret's close, and that would have paid for the upkeep of the, um, the altar to St. Margaret. Um, what they would have looked like in the church, um, the Ardrossan sarcophagus is that the coffin bit of it is quite highly decorated. <coughs> Um, nothing like that has come, has been found. We do have up in the antiquities room just this sort of rather plain, blurry looking coffin. Um, so I think that would mean these are probably under the floor. You could probably just see the lids. Um, but they've all been carved from a single piece of stone in our recumbent. Um, we have some images of them since recovery. <coughs> Uh, that's the Dead Oak Museum, as mentioned. That, that closed, was, it, it had a, a, a history of disasters of those people, really. It opened in 1914 and almost immediately got taken over um, by the War Office. Um, so it, it never really lived up to its full potential and then um, was taken down. But this, this picture is, this is new, so if you heard this talk at the ARP conference, this is new information for you. Um, they're taken from the Dundee Photographic Survey, which was completed in 1916. These photographs are taken much earlier because the photographer was A.C. Lamb, and he died in 1897. So the caption on these says, Stone Coffin Covers from St. Mary's Church, now in Dead Up Museum. And they're contained in the section of the survey dedicated to the Hauf, um, the graveyard. We don't think it's the Hauf. Um, the, the buildings behind it are a bit too close. So we do think it might be in the, in the precinct of the churches. And that, that coffin is a coffin that I just showed you kind of only in one piece. Um, and that is, is like a, um, a mantle from a fireplace, and that is in the antiquities room in the steeple, um, and one of the stones. So these are rediscovered um, by a man called Darren Ayers, who has a website called the Tombs of Dundee Health. Um, so he was able to add that bit of information. 
So the stones themselves, we, we just kind of given them, we kind of had to give them names and we just had those drawings from um, the 19th century. So not all the descriptions actually match up to the names, but they do have museum <coughs> numbers, um, but we kept the names to kind of keep it consistent. So um, a lot of them have this sort of single cross shaft, um, sort of based on the processional cross, not quite a cavalry cross, because they don't have the, the three steps, and none of them have those little steps. Um, this is the one that was recorded by the Royal Commission, and this is the one that kind of drew the attention of Dr. Ross um, back in 1911. So it's a little boat um, with someone sitting in the front of it, um, a hand up in blessing, a little animal climbing up the rigging, um, a, a hand of a sword pointing down, and then on the side of it, there's an axe. Um, so what this all means is a bit, um, no, we're, we're not quite sure. Um, at one of our first doors open day sessions, a member of the public came up with a nice theory that maybe it is illustrating um, that legend of the, the shipwreck um, that led to the founding of the church. And, and, and it could be, you know, a ship at sea being calmed down, you know, by the blessing, which, which is a nice idea. Um, and well, there's also um, a theory that the more sort of strictly religious, that it's the ship of the soul and um, <clears throat> the arm of God, or things like that. But we don't know, and whatever it was, it must have meant enough um, to people, for people to see it without any sort of text um, being on the stone. Um, next one. We've kind of been calling it the fish scale stone. And several of the stones have the, I don't know how you can see it, have these um, swords on them. And the stones are all the same, they have this sort of five-lobed pommel. And though the stones themselves have been dated to about 1300, it's very rough um, dating that we have to take, except anybody else has another theory. But these five pommeled swords are much earlier. So why, why these are turning up, and I think one of them turned up on a, um, what they call the Knight's Burial in Edinburgh that turned up a couple summers ago. It has the same um, five-lobed pommel, much earlier style of sword. Um, the fish scale, well, what, what it's been called the fish scales, but they're actually tegula, they're meant to be like roof tiles. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, it's not a hog, hogbacks are earlier and have that sort of curved top to them. This is sort of later on in the family of hogbacks. Um, it's called a cope stone, but those little tiles are copying the roof tiles that you see in a hogback. And it's actually quite, this is the smallest of the stones, you can see the measurements. Um, so it's not covering a full sized burial. Um, and it has a, that, this little Greek cross on, inside the end of it as well. Um, and then the other end is plain. Um, this one um, at the ARP conference, we were calling this sort of Johannes' stone, but someone at the um, ARP conference had a closer look at it, and it's actually um, I honk Hamnes, so he corrected that, but it, it kind of it means John, and that kind of goes back to that. Um, and this one has, again, it has your cross with the central um, shaft. It has one of those swords. And then it has sort of a shield. And on the shield are uh, three other shields. And um, the antiquarian Gervais identified it the arms of the Hay family. And it, it's one of the few stones that actually has an inscription on it. And the inscription's in Latin, but it can be loosely translated that here lies John, the son of Philip Ciceris which means tailor. So whether or not that was a job title or um, his name, we're not sure. But after our last doors opened in September, a member of the public had been going through some French um, genealogical sites, and he tried to match up um, members of the Hay family with named individuals, and he couldn't find any in the, in the, sort of the Scottish branches of the family. But there was a, a French branch of the family that did have a Philip who had a son, Jean or John, and so he's put forward the theory that, and that they had their lands taken away in some sort of political intrigue. So he was wondering if, if maybe this family came to stay with their Scottish relatives and the Ciceros is maybe a comment on him being cut off from his lands, <laughs> which <laughs> is a nice theory, I don't know. <laughs> um, this one has a little tiny pair of wool shears. Um, I think you can see the scans probably a bit better on the website. Um, it's up near the top, and that, that's the only other decoration. And, on, and again, this is quite a short stone. Um, so whether or not it's someone associated with the wool trade. And this is a really disappointing stone, <laughs> because the 19th century drawing we have of it 
or we have um, a fifth stone is when a quite a complicated sort of geometrical cross at the top of it. And that stone wasn't amongst the ones we have. We just have this one, which in that old photograph was there, and it was in one piece. Now it's in two pieces. And it just has these very simple carvings on the one almost looks like some sort of a bowl or something from above, and the other one almost looks like an open book in a circle. Um, but the quality of carving on the end of it is much nicer on that sort of almost thistle thing. So that one's a bit strange. And it's not, even though it was outside, it's, it's not been worn. It's not like, it doesn't look like there are other carvings that have been worn off. Um, this is another one that actually has a carving on it. Um, and it's to Matilda. Um, again, in Latin, it says to pray for the soul of Matilda, daughter of Tom. And again, it's got that central cross shaft. But on the side of it, we have um, a bodkin and shears. So her little um, sort of sewing equipment. And the shape of the bodkins um, echoed in the top of the cross shaft there. Um, and who Matilda and Tom are, and we don't know. <laughs> Um, this one, again, has one of those swords on it, um, and it has a little face up in the top there, like, almost like a little peak cap in the middle, um, and, and the shape of that almost looks um, like metal work, kind of echoes um, sort of a simple brooch. This one, um, we call the lady's headstone, and of the three smaller stones, the first time we had a doors open day, um, the public were allowed to vote on which stone they'd like to see go into McManus galleries. And this, this is the one that, um, that one, so this, this one can be seen actually in McManus. But this stone is only half of it. Uh, again, it has these two swords on it. Um, and this one's interesting that there's actually a cross um, in, the, in the sword. Um, and this, by, by the costume on the ladies, we can kind of deep this stone a little bit better. Um, the one in the center and the one on the left side are wearing what's known as a barbette, which is sort of a band of linen that went under the, the chin, and the, the ends fastened on the top. Um, and then the, the sort of pillbox hat on the top um, is a band of stiffened linen, and that's known as a toque, and it sort of formed a, a closed hat. Um, and we know that that came to vogue about the middle of the 13th century, because it can be seen on manuscripts and effigies both in Britain and Europe. And the third head wears, almost she almost has a sort of a short veil um, with flowers or crown across it. And there's actually a little cross carved into the stone, almost like graffiti as well. Um, and yeah, that one has two swords, so um, theory on that one, I'm not quite sure. Um, so the website, I think. I can kind of echo what, what some other people have been saying. The idea of the website was to try to get people to be a bit interactive, to send in their theories, um, maybe send in photographs of things seen similar stones. And, and we've had a few, but I'd, I'd say we sort of have quality over quantity. Like we've had, um, um, I think, Champion, Mr. Champion, who's been recording the um, church graffiti down in Norfolk. So we've had a lot of sort of professional archaeologists and people writing into us, but I'd love to just have even members of the public just, um, even if you saw a similar stone somewhere, take a photograph and, and send it in. Um, a lot of people are showing interest in it, and they're quite happy to have us sort of come out and speak to them about it, but, but trying to get that return um, has been a bit more difficult. Um, Though the vote was quite popular, people you know, took part in actually doing the vote, but they don't seem to want to do something that requires maybe a bit more effort. Um, <laughs> um, but we're also looking, because the, the website, um, we'd like to have a volunteer maybe manage the website so we could also get it out there a bit more, um, you know, have some, a bit more advertising for it as well, because at the moment it's a bit reactive, like someone emails us and put it up on the website, that kind of thing. But there, there's a facility where people could have discussions, um, and I'd really like to see that become a bit more active. Um, what next? We'd like to, um, as you can see, they're still just sitting on pallets in this people, and this people also only open for quite limited times of the year. It's open for several weeks this summer. It's usually open for doors open day, but it's still not regular access. So we'd like to look into the redisplay um, of the stones. We'd like to, you know, upgrade the interpretation. They do all have labels now, um, but we'd like something a bit nicer than the pallets. Um, we'd like to try to maybe orientate them so they're they're east to west. 
um, and um, the Ardwasan sarcophagus, they've discovered that that may have been painted. So one of the next things we're having um, a lady named Irma Hermans, who um, is an art historian who, who restores paintings, but she can she was looking at layers of paint to maybe take a look to see if we can find if they've been colored um, in the past. Um, and other than that, just trying to gather the research, like you know, if someone, one of those French genealogists right there, or people who have access, I'm sure there's lots of church records. The um, church was associated with that Abbey of Lindors, so that's a whole other area um, of research that possibly could be looked into. Um, looking at comparative stone carvings. We have had interest, there's a stone carver named David McGovern um, who works in traditional style, and he did do his opening for us, so he's actually made a replica of the ship's stone, a portion of it, which I think is in his garden. But it's interesting exploring that style and, and how the stones might have been worked. And when we did the sessions with the teachers, um, as to what they were most interested in, what they wanted to know about, what the student wanted to know most about, was actually the people who were involved in the stones, um, from the stone carver, but also the modern day people that are interested in the archaeologist people's jobs um, that were involved in discovering the stones and interpreting the stones. So that was kind of an interesting outcome that they were kind of interested in us. <laughs> um, so that's <laughs> that's really about it. Um, I'll put the website up. There's a little bookmark thing about um, that has a website on it. We also we produced um, a catalog that I have a hard copy. You can download this on the website, but I can. Um, give anyone a copy who's interested in it as well. And there's, of course, an article um, in the Top Hat Journal. Um, but the information is always sort of changing and updating. So.